It's okay. We've got Didi here from Capta. Uh, <laughs> Colin came to our last, uh, our last conference and expressed an interest in, in talking, so <laughs> here he is now. And it could happen to you as well. If you want to do this, come up and talk to me afterwards. Uh, Colin's uh, been working in, uh, well, as, a, as a technical test manager for many years now and uh, is a strong advocate of shift left and, and, and BDD in particular. And he's here to talk to us about BDD with zero known defects and combining the two to deliver very robust software. So over to you, Colin. Cheers. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? So title of this talk, Behavior Driven Development, Delivering Zero Known Defects. Now, uh, this came up uh, last year. And I'm going to kind of point at Roderick here and say, well, myself and Roderick had a conversation. I started saying, oh, you know, we should fix every bug we find. It should all be good, et cetera, et cetera. And this made me really think about trying to capture what I meant. And so I set about writing a, a, a set of case studies, white papers about zero known defects and, and behavior driven de development. And what do I really mean by this? So I can capture this in a few words. Software should just work. To me, this is incredibly important, and it seems to be something we seem to have forgotten. It should just work. I want us to be delivering, as professionals, software to our clients, software to our customers, where they can be really pleased, really happy with what they've got. They don't come back and say, oh, crikey, I can't believe you didn't fix that. Oh, crikey, I can't believe this doesn't work. Our professional teams should like the fact that they are sending out good quality software. They shouldn't be scared that they are sending out software and crossing their fingers and hoping that things work. And it was mentioned earlier in one of the other talks about sending software out the door that had not been tested. And that's an incredibly scary thing. We just should not be doing that. But look, software should just work. Now, not as was once pointed out to me, the other way of phrasing this, which is software should just work. <laughs> so I mean just work, as in, and for people who can't see me because you're, you're online at the moment, I'm kind of waving my hands around saying that, you know, hallelujah, happy software should just work, you know. But we should have fun while making software and making software that works. You know, if I turn around to you and say you've got to fix every defect in the system and uh, it's got to be perfect, and it, you know, you're, you're quickly going to be turning around and saying, oh God, that sounds like, you know, working late. Uh, as it was said earlier, um, you know, uh, getting the pieces in, dragging everybody in to work in testing. That's not what I'm talking about. We should have fun. We should have so much fun in testing that we want to take our work home with us. Now, I don't work in robotics, but I still took my work home with us, my, my, my work home with me. And what I mean by that is that when I would learned about behavior-driven development, once I would learned about delivering something that just works, I thought, well, why aren't I using this at home? When I make a robot, and I have a passion for little, stupid, geeky robots, uh, this robot's called George. Uh, the sad thing is all of my robots are called George, so this could cause some confusion if anyone has heard me talk about robots before. Um, George is driven by tests. He is driven by behaviors. Test-driven development, behavior-driven development is the cornerstone of how this robot works. And as a random example, and I've just pulled this out, as uh, one of uh, the files that drive George. And you can see on here are a set of very functional tests, you know, test-driven development. You know, there are things I want. You know, George has got a load of blinky lights. Uh, George has got an infrared sensor. Um, the infrared sensor being the low down two little eyes you can see at the bottom. Uh, he's also got a camera for object recognition as well. So this is just one small part of his test estate. And he just works. He just drives around. He's not perfect. He does have a habit of trying to leap off tables, and I'm working on that. But the point is, he just works. So how did I get there? How did I go from a position of having software at home that I've written myself that was sort of OK to being in a position where I'm now applying this mantra that it should just work to everything that I program in my own time? Well, it all started with work. And it all started with thinking about what is behavior-driven development. And to me, behavior-driven development is fundamentally the story of the Wizard of Oz, or as I like to call it, the wonderful Wizard of Oz approach to software development. Now, when Dorothy met the Tin Man, the Scarecrow, and the Cowardly Lion, 
they all had issues. They didn't really know what they were going to do about them, but they knew that there was this funky, groovy, yellow brick road in front of them. And Dorothy, along with one of the two, uh, two uh, we're only the fairy godmother or the witch or, or whatever, it's different, different versions of the story have it written in different ways, um, basically helped these three to realize that they could work together collaboratively and they could solve their goals. They could get to the end of the story, the image on the right there, where they're all happy. The cowardly lion, the scarecrow, and the tin man have now solved the things that were getting in their way. I know that's not software, but the principle is there. The cowardly lion, the tester, who does not have the confidence to speak up, has learned that actually speaking up and becoming early, involved early in a project is absolutely critical. The tin man, the business analyst, does not necessarily have the heart to realize that they need to be including the tester and the developer. And as we said earlier, the focus becomes testing. Everyone is working on testing, not I am doing development. I am doing, I am doing testing over here as a tester, and I'm doing analysis. The business analyst needs to realize the whole team needs to be involved and not just be sending monolithic documents to one group or another. And apologies to the developers in the room, because that only leaves one choice for you guys. The scarecrow without a brain. I apologize. I come from a testing background. I'm allowed to say things like this. Yeah. The scarecrow with no brain. Basically, this poor guy doesn't, doesn't know any better. Somebody's told him, go learn how to program code. Go learn how to write code. Somebody mentioned unit tests one day. Just does not know any better. And only by working with this team, this team working effectively together, can that problem be solved. Dorothy could be the test manager, the test lead, the project manager. Could be a developer or a tester, a BA, doesn't matter. But Dorothy is the person that's come in and said, guys, we can do something better here. We can work together. And what they've really done, what they've really said, is this. There is a leap of faith needed. Analysis, development, and testing are actually the same activity. They're the activity of delivering working software, delivering successful software. Now, in the first presentation, it was mentioned by Rob that everyone should be focused on testing. I agree. And I'll go further and say everyone should be focused on delivery, successful delivery of that product out to customers. There is nothing else that matters in our industry apart from going home on time and getting, making sure you get lots of pizza. So why did my team choose BDD? Why did we choose BDD? It's a good question, and it's something I want to quickly look at. Well, we had a situation to think about. We had three major releases behind us on a particular project of OK software. It was OK in that it sort of did what it said on the tin. It had a number of defects that we had to come up with, to be honest, spurious reasons why they weren't high enough priority to not fix. Most of the reasons were not actually due to the fact that this, the, the bug should not be fixed. They were down to the fact we just did not have time to fix them. We were running late. We were ready for a fourth release. And our client made it very clear in the contract that this fourth release had attached to it significant penalties. Now, in, in industry, there's nothing like focusing your mind by saying you're going to lose money. So we came at BDD, perhaps not originally for the right reason. We came at it because we needed to make sure that we did not do a release of OK software. We need to do a release of excellent software. So what could we change to improve the situation? We decided on a few things. We said we must produce rock-solid software. We're not paying those penalties. But we know, because of our clients' way of working, that they will want change and change and more change throughout the project. So how can we deliver rock-solid software while supporting change? So think of a house. If an architect says to, to the builder, start building that house, and then every two days or every week, they give them some slightly different plans, 
chances are that house is going to be a bit iffy. It's probably going to fall down. Certainly won't be up to building regs. So we had to basically find a way to produce software that was rock solid and extendable. And to make matters worse, it included a giant state machine, a, a, an almighty state machine of hundreds and hundreds of business rules required because, uh, due to legislation. And we need to make sure that those rules were all tested. And we need to make sure that they all work together. And anyone who's worked on complex state machine testing will know that the permutations of test cases, if you were to do things manually, would be impossible. And even with automation can be extremely tricky. We realized that every single build, we would need to have 100% of our regression suite run. This was very important to us because we could not afford for defect upon defect to be creeping into the software and we would not know about this until X weeks, X days later, where suddenly it would bite us because we knew we would not have the time to fix things then. And lastly, we said we want to reduce the acceptance test duration. A grumble from our clients and an absolute we hated it from our acceptance test team at the time was that acceptance testing took weeks in previous phases and was unsatisfactory. How can we change that? What can we do better? So we said we should improve things. So what happened? This is a summary of what happened. We have 1,500, at the time, 1,500, it's closer to 2,000 now, 1,500 end-to-end -end tests that run through that state machine, they all pass. They are all in continuous integration. The moment a developer checks code in, it triggers a compilation, it triggers all the tests to be run. And they run in less than five minutes. So we're only adding five minutes effectively to the build time and the developers get a big squeaky clean, it passes, or a failure where it doesn't. And putting this all together, it meant we could have zero known defects at the point of release. And this is kind of leading up to the meat of what I want to be talking about. We thought, well, why stop at fixing, why stop at passing all the scenarios? Wouldn't it be great if we could also fix every defect? And we realized that this was a choice that we could make. We did not have to personally accept decades of dogma. I mean, an ISTQB or an ISEB qualification foundation in software testing that gives me endless reasons not to create working software that just works. Instead, we could actually say, we are going to achieve this. It's a choice we could make. Now, as a warning, I'm going to say here, because whenever I say zero known defects, people jump on Google and they do a search, and the first hit that comes back will be zero defects. And zero defects was a management program from the 1960s that was designed to increase production, productivity, and eliminate all sources of failure. It itself, ironically, was a failure. The quote here from Lean Software Development. One of the fastest ways to kill motivation is what is called in the US Army a zero defects mentality. It's an atmosphere that tolerates no mistakes and demands perfection. Zero known defects is not that. We cannot fix a defect we do not know about. We can do everything in our power to stop those defects from occurring. But where we know that there is a defect, we choose to fix it. We don't prioritize it. We don't put a severity against it. We don't come up with a spurious reason to say, well, it's slightly the wrong shade of blue. We just fix it because this keeps our code squeaky clean. Why do we choose to do this? This goes back to my mantra. It should just work. And I've already compared software to buying a car or um, a kettle. These are objects you expect to work. If you buy a car, you're driving off the forecourt, and the windows fall off, and the indicators don't work, you're probably going to go back to the garage straight away and say, sorry, I think this is a new car. I really think this should be working. You wouldn't expect to have to pay maintenance on a car just to have it working. Although, strangely, we sort of do, because we're forever buying extended warranties. Why don't we demand our car should work longer? 
We want to minimize rework. As developers and testers, BAs, we want to be moving on to the next great thing. Our engineers should be proud of the work that they produce. And as Eric mentioned earlier, not crossing their fingers and hoping things will work when they go live. And our customers should be looking forward to what they are given and what they are going to be given. Now, this all sounds a bit kind of pie in the sky at the moment. How do we practically go about this? Well, I had to be aware of something. And I sat in a talk uh, uh, quite a while back, a couple of years back now, actually. And it was, it was mentioned that if you're a manager and you come up with some great ideas and you print them out on some pieces of paper and you blue tack them around the office, you could be in danger of dictating to a team a particular way of working and it's then taken one or two ways. It's either taken as we're going to work late on a Friday and we're not going to get pizza, or it's going to be interpreted as I'll ignore that, it's just some manager speaking. So the way we looked at this, although I was trying to leave this, I could not dictate. So the team came up with three rules, three guiding principles that would drive what they do. They said, that they will attempt to fix every outstanding defect by the end of the day. It's a reasonable thing, isn't it? There's a bug. Can you try and fix it? Sounds reasonable. That was my suggestion to the team. It's not a dictation. I'm not saying they must fix every bug. I'm saying, guys, if you've got time, could you try and fix those defects? That sounds reasonable. But what it led to was the team coming back and saying, well, we'll go with that one, but with the caveat of can we call it a week and not a day, we think we can do better. So they went back to the t business and said, and to our client, bear in mind this is on a project with penalties, that we would guarantee to fix every outstanding known defect, and that's the important point there, known defect, by the end of each week, and absolutely before delivery. That latter part is important in case you have a midweek delivery, so you can't use Oh well, we're delivering on Friday, but we sorry, delivering on Wednesday, but we said we fixed the defects by Friday. You can't use that as an excuse. We'll never allow the open defect count to go above three at any one time. This was an important thing that they pointed out. The number of open defects is critical to success because defects breed defects. If something doesn't work, chances are something behind that doesn't work. The change I make to fix the software may well itself introduce another defect. Whereas if I have software that works, I don't need to change it to make it work. It already works. And therefore, defects breed defects. Lack of defects breeds lack of defects. The team chose these conditions as something they wanted to achieve. And we got some benefits from this, some very clear benefits. We've got clean builds. We've already talked about behavior-driven development really briefly. 100% of our scenarios pass. We have zero known defects prior to release. This clearly means we need no defect triage meetings. We're not having conversations to come up with spurious reasons to not fix things for our customers. We have ongoing automated regression testing for no cost. And we have a happy team. Importantly, not just happy developers, BAs, and testers, but a happy client. And in the middle, in the mix of all that, a happy acceptance team, because delivering into acceptance was when we said we would have zero known defects. So what actually happened? How did we get there? Because there's an elephant in the room. Hands up who spotted the elephant. Hands up who turned over the slide and spotted the elephant. <laughs> Okay, we inherited defects from previous releases. I mentioned there were three previous releases. They were okay, but they had bugs. They had faults that became failures in some cases in life, most of which would be addressed. But reasons will always be found to lower a priority of something so that it doesn't get fixed. How do we address that? Well, we drew a line in the sand. We said we're going to fix all outstanding defects because we've really got a choice here. If we say that there will be no known defects, we're either, either saying that is a genuine statement or putting a God almighty ex um, uh, uh, asterisk against that and saying 
when we say no known defects, we're discounting all previous releases. So I'm just going to hide out behind this door now and pretend there are no defects in the software, and you guys can carry on in, in, in a oblivious um, way, assuming everything is fine. Well, that didn't seem fair. That seemed like we were lying to ourselves, lying to our customers if we said that. So we did not do that. We drew a line in the sand. This is a big white elephant. This is a big elephant in the room to solve. We committed to these three principles. Now, does that mean we achieved them instantly in the very first sprint that we did, the very first iteration? No, of course we didn't. You know, we've got this backlog of defects to fix. It's going to take time. But we moved in that direction. And we knew we were going to get there. The most important team member, and it's just it's sad in a way, but it's a shame that, that you know, I, I do see a bit of a sort of a them and us between technical members of a team and the project management function. My most valuable member of the team is the project manager. Because that project manager bought into this and fought and got agreement from our client and other aspects of the business that we would clear that backlog of defects. We would start afresh with zero known defects. So I bought that project manager a lot of beer. Um, I'm not sure I helped their project plan estimation the following day. The project manager is key. So we did a release one and a half years ago with zero known defects in it as a result. And eight subsequent releases since then, we still have zero known defects. We still have 100% of our scenarios passing, both system test and at unit test levels. We use BDD for both. We use the same frameworks for both. So what have we learned? Well, we've learned BDD and zero known defects can be modular. BDD is absolutely about communication and collaboration, that upfront set of exercises to understand what it is you're going to deliver, and more importantly, why you're going to deliver it, the business purpose. But we should not forget things like regression testing. We should not forget that we're going to be delivering something down the line that will have automated tests. Zero known defects is driven by the team with management support. It's not, and this is what I don't want to happen because I'm kind of nervous that someone's going to print off that slide 20 times and stick it on their office walls. I feel I should have put a copyright message on it to stop that from happening, but you know, there you go. Um, please don't do that. That's not what we're talking about. Management support is key. Is key. Senior managers need to have confidence in BDD and with zero known defects as a process. One of the ways they can get that confidence is by looking at de delivery schedules. We no longer need uh, compressed defect schedules. And to, uh, to steal something from earlier, the Gantt chart of devastation, that compressed time at the end where test moves out, testing's easy. Testing's the last, per the last people in the process. Oh, that's okay. We'll buy them pizza and they can work late. Sorry, I wanted to go and play some sports this evening. I really didn't want to be in the office testing this. You know, the software should just work. It works if on day one we're adopting a process, a practice, and principles in the way we act as professionals that set us on that goal of success. And it actually works when delivered if we keep to our guns throughout the process. I don't make Gantt charts anymore. Uh, Microsoft Project, I don't really use. Because I have seen Gantt charts of devastation, and I think it's a fantastic phrase. Do you have it copyrighted? Can I borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> Zero main defects becomes addictive. One and a half years later, and we are still looking, and we are still following it, it's the behavior we want to adhere to. It's the behavior that we want to achieve in all that we do, and we want to be known for this. Now, under my governance at the moment, there are three projects. One has achieved this. One is, if you put it on a percentage, 50% of the way there. And another is probably just starting out. That's brilliant. Those two projects are moving in this direction. They're going to get there. And they're going to get there because they have the project manager buying in, development manager buying in, test manager buying in, not those three dictating to the team. 
So we've got time for questions. I've purposely left hopefully a few minutes. Right, thank you. Brian, any questions? Yeah. Rob's got his hand up first. Thank you for that, Colin. Really enjoyed it. So, um, not all defects are binary, though. Not all defects are black and white. Of this is wrong, this is right. There's quite a lot of grey in there. And while your team are fixing those defects that maybe not black and white, they're choosing not to do something else. Do you think that's an acceptable way for, of working? Because in my experience, you know, you may fix some low priority issues, but you're not building features that are going to generate revenue. Yeah, I think that's that. Absolutely, it's a really good question, and this goes to my thing. Uh, so, so the other half, as well as the software should just work. The other half of the mantra, if you like, is defects breed defects, and lack of defects breeds lack of defects. So once you are, if you think of it in terms of a funnel, so once you start working in this way and build release after release, things get better. That will naturally lead you towards, and you will never reach it, but it will lead you towards a singularity where there just are no more defects. And at that point, when someone comes, sorry, no more known defects. And at that point, when someone turns around and says, oh, I'm not really sure about the size of that font on that screen, is it, oh, I'm really not sure, you then have created that space to have a conversation and not turn around and say, sorry, we're going to have to low priority, put that to low priority, because we just don't have time. Instead, you've created that air gap, that bubble in which you can exist and have a conversation with the business and maybe mock some things out. And there's a developer that sits opposite me. And one of the things I love about this guy is that someone in the business will turn around and say, oh, you know what, I've had this idea. And he'll quickly just render up some HTML screen for them and go, is that kind of what you're after? Or kind of not what you're after? And they can have those conversations. So these are things that could be classed as defects down the line. But they're, as you say, they're, they're not black and white. But we've created that space, that gap to do so. Hello. Um, so, has this process for you had an effect on the number of unknown defects that you ship? I don't know. They're unknown. <laughs> well, surely, by the time can the I, customers get to them. Can I rephrase it? Has it had an impact on the number of uh, known failures found in production? I can certainly answer that. Yes, it's gone massively down. The first point of evidence of that is in acceptance testing. The most recent release that we did uh, was characterized by the head of the acceptance test team as uh, the fastest release to production we've done yet. And it only had, just prior to production, four minor observations. They were so inconsequential in her eyes, she didn't even use the word defect. And historically, she would be the kind of person that would jump up and down and say, everything's a high priority defect. Yeah. I know that's pre-production, but then going into production, we typically get one failure reported back every several months at the moment is what we're at, you know. And uh, I've got to be careful what I say. This is software that is used uh, throughout the UK every day by potentially hundreds of thousands of organizations. Okay. Another question. So, when we have new car brakes for three or five years after I buy it, I take it back to the dealers and they fix it for free under warranty. Are you ready yet to ship software under warranty and fix defects for free? Oh, that's, a, that's an unfair question. Can I not ask that? No, that's not. I'm joking. It, it, yeah, it's absolutely a fair question. Um, there's, a, there's another singularity to go to where you say actually that fixing defects is so. Um, is so infrequent in production that forevermore you can do them for free. That's like the final singularity you go to. Uh, that one, we're nowhere near to. Absolutely, we agree. The point that you're making says, actually, years down the line, can we fix those defects? And potentially, we may have fallen out of warranty. Yeah? We're close to that. I think there are commercial reasons in the way we engage with some of our clients and the way our clients uh, want to work because of who their parent organizations are. Sorry, that's horribly vague. I'm trying not to drop a particular name in at the moment. Um, that means that that is very difficult down the line. And that commercial agreements at the moment still exist that say, you know, you have to pay maintenance every single year. And are those agreements needed in the current way of doing things? Yes. 
So I know that's not a success, and I know that's something, it's something I would like to work on and change, but there are other pressures outside of the, uh, the development and the project management sphere that stop me from doing that at present. And I know it's a gap, and I know it's something I want to look at, and I've already started having some conversations with particular key people to say, what can we do about this? So that's a really vague answer and stuff. Come talk to me afterwards, and I might, might better give you a bit more information. Okay. <laughs> One more question, sorry, from uh, which has come on online. Yeah. Um, it's what was the approximate transition time while going into DVD? I've got a graph on this, and this graph is over uh, this particular. So I said our well, client uh, for this particular project like, uh, comes from a very waterfall background. So we talked about earlier about moving from uh, yearly releases to down, all the way down to weekly releases. You know, they like multi-month or, or even multi-year releases. Um, so this particular phase, this fourth phase, was itself was approximately one year in duration. The actual active parts post-contract negotiation were about nine months. So over the course of nine months, we first of all had to clear that debt of, of defects, and then we had to move on in this good new world. Clearing that debt, becoming familiar with tools, frameworks, getting people up to speed, supporting people when needed, that probably took the first month at least. If you drew a line out at that point, and this is why it was so key we had project manager buy-in, is if you extrapolated you know, the line, how is our progress, how is our burn down, you would find that that line would have stretched out into the year 2020. It looked horrendous. It was the worst line you've ever seen in your life. The client got a bit nervous. You spent a month in this new way of doing things, so everything is awful. No, it's not. What we're expecting to see is a Z curve. We're expecting to see us dropping off this cliff where we start getting build after build, less defects. Therefore, we start getting to a position where we know that we're moving towards and eventually we'll reach zero known defects and have these excellent quality scenarios that have been validated correctly. So we know that they're good quality. They've been validated by a customer. And these scenarios run and pass as well. So the answer question really is probably the in a nine-month project, the first month, month and a half, was pretty much a write-off in terms of delivery. Thanks very much. Thank you.